On March 5th, 1959, something happened in Arkansas that many people don't even know about. A massacre. Black teenagers were left in their dormitory with a padlock locked from the outside and were burned alive. The fire was meant to kill all 69 boys who lived there, but 21 didn't make it out alive. Nobody ever knew it existed because of uh, the ability of the state of Arkansas to do such a fantastic job at covering it up. Even now, decades later, there is still no official cause of the fire. Officials in Arkansas turned a blind eye to forensic evidence and never sought justice. But one thing has changed since then. More than 60 years later, the boys finally have a memorial. This is the story of the young black teenagers who were most likely killed by white supremacy. In the 1950s, the history of American boarding schools was diverse, but never equal. This was when schools started accommodating the baby boom and expanding middle class and desegregation. In the post-war era, boarding schools across the country were used for various purposes. These schools weren't just meant to educate or discipline children. They were also used as a way to keep white children away from African Americans. During this period, the level of people's education depended on their race, and there were various boarding schools for different races. Not many of these institutions had multiple races. Now, when I mean discipline, I mean a different kind of discipline than what we use today. Paddling and smacking children was common. Teachers could pull your hair, harm you, smack you, or even use the dunce cap method to humiliate you. These were all common methods for teaching children how to behave. In the South, schools were designed to oppose racial integration strongly. Between 1952 and 1962, numerous schools were constructed in rural areas, specifically for African American students. The state itself built approximately 500 primary and secondary schools, ensuring that each county had one well-equipped school for white students. These white schools were bigger and more technologically advanced than African American ones. They offered an enhanced academic curriculum with greater emphasis on mathematics, science, and vocal training. Industrial schools were designed to educate, employ, and reform juvenile offenders. But the differences between segregated white reform and black reform schools in Arkansas couldn't have been more obvious. White institutions were mainly designed to educate teenagers. Here, the staff treated the boys like students and taught them practical skills that would later come in handy when they were to seek work, such as carpentry or metalwork. But the boys at Arkansas Negro Industrial School weren't so lucky. Arkansas had two such juvenile correctional facilities, one in Jefferson County and the other in Wrightsville, just southeast of Little Rock. I mean, you probably heard about Little Rock, the Little Rock Nine. In 1957, the federal troops escorted nine black students into Arkansas's Central High School to integrate the school. This was when the South organized a massive resistance and the rest of the country realized that racial integration wasn't going to be that easily accepted in the Southern states. Whites set up private academies to educate their children and use public funds to support their efforts of segregated facilities. They also tried to intimidate black families in every way possible. One way was to make sure that their children wouldn't get the education they deserve. Arkansas is the perfect example of that. And the industrial school clearly represents the sheer disparity between the white and black reform institutions. The boys in the Arkansas Negro Industrial School were treated like prisoners. This facility housed 69 boys, ages 13 to 17, forced to live in horrible conditions. These teenagers were here for being homeless, orphans, or committing petty crimes some of whom were wrongly accused. They were forced to farm the land around the facility and to do manual labor. The staff beat them with leather straps, and they left them to go on for days wearing only rags. The boys didn't even have access to a toilet. They were using buckets instead. More than half of them didn't wear underwear or socks, and it was not uncommon for the teenagers to go for weeks without changing clothes or bathing. The water at the facility was also deemed undrinkable. Their living quarters were cramped, with no place to breathe. The boys lived in a building constructed in 1936 under the Works Progress Administration, which Time Magazine characterized as unstable or shaky. Systemic poverty brought by white supremacy sealed the fate of these boys. Racially disparate treatment permeated the United States criminal justice system. Wrongful convictions were a common practice, and lynching led to the deaths of thousands of black people. This was the Jim Crow South, which profoundly impacted Arkansas's history and many lawyers would capitalize on African-American victims, especially the school desegregation crisis. Here, very few white Americans wanted to live equally with black people. During the period of Reconstruction, states located in the southern region of the United States were placed under military control by the government. The Reconstruction caused numerous changes, such as giving rights to black Americans to vote, giving rights to U.S. citizenship to formerly enslaved black people, 
the ability to open up black churches, and better access to farmland and education. But when the Reconstruction was over, the South was not having it. They quickly took these freedoms and rights away. It was in their power to do so because the federal government governs the United States from Washington, D.C., but the state government holds huge authority over matters in their respective regions, such as education. Here's how it works. The federal government has national powers. Federal laws apply to everyone in the U.S. Local and state laws apply to the people who actually work and live in a particular state or territory. In a state like Arkansas, the governor would be responsible for making decisions. Orville Falbus was the 36th governor of Arkansas from 1955 to 1967. Now, this is the governor who ordered the Arkansas National Guard to block the entrance to the Central High School to keep the Little Rock Nine from entering the school. He was the same governor who was in office during the dormitory fire. On the morning of March 5, 1959, while people were enjoying gospel music on the radio, a breaking news bulletin interrupted the program. It was reported that a mysterious fire had consumed the Arkansas Negro Boys Industrial School in Wrightsville, but the truth was much darker than that. At 4 a.m., the staff abandoned the dormitory, then someone locked the door from the outside. The boys were forced to claw and fight their way out, while 48 of the African-American teenagers successfully escaped the blazing structure by jumping out of a window. 21 teenagers were unable to flee and died that night. When you take a look at the building's diagram, you can see that even if there were a few doors in the facility, there was only one front door, and that one was locked. The boys that remained stuck inside were tucked into the back corner of the building and were burned alive. A couple of years ago, CNN did a story on Frank Lawrence, who has been trying to solve Arkansas's biggest mystery for years. The 48 boys who did survive found a way to break free by removing the metal screens from two windows. The shocking incident captured the public attention for a brief time. It also brought attention to the miserable conditions these teenagers lived in. Lawrence explained that the 69 boys would sleep in a cramped space with very little room to move. They had just one foot of distance separating them, and they only had a 30-gallon water tank to bathe themselves. A significant aspect of our history involves the prevalence of white supremacy and the long-standing discrimination that African Americans have endured in Arkansas. The idea of separate but equal was never truly equal. Instead, it perpetuated an inherent inequality. Because the building was in such a deteriorated condition, many believe that the wiring is what led to the fire. But Lawrence claims it was intentional. He explained that everyone wants to think that this fire was an accident, probably because they want to avoid further embarrassment for the governor and the state of Arkansas. Lawrence believes that the events during the desegregation crisis crisis with the Little Rock High School students led up to the Wrightsville fire. The burning of the dormitory was a way to scare the black community. It was designed so that black people would say, oh no, we are not supposed to be integrating schools anymore. We are going to stop this desegregation and strive to get separate but equal treatment. Before the fire, Governor Faubus visited the Wrightsville school and personally witnessed the poor living conditions of the boys, yet he did not propose any improvements. But after the fire, in a newspaper article, the governor seemed disturbed by the loss of the 21 boys and referred to the fire as inexcusable. The governor wasted no time and quickly called for a hearing. The goal was to find out what happened and whether anyone was to be held responsible. Lawrence pointed out that in 1959, the knowledge and techniques of preserving a crime scene were already available. However, on the morning of the incident, the scene was being dismantled. People used hoses, rakes, and shovels as if they were trying to hide something. The school staff and superintendent, L.R. Gaines, provided their testimonies about that fateful night, noting that the boys had been locked inside and left unsupervised. On the other hand, the Pulaski County Grand Jury found multiple people and agencies responsible, but did not bring any criminal charges. It basically looks like everyone was being blamed, while nobody was truly held accountable. Ironically, the land where the school once stood is now occupied by the Arkansas Department of Correction Facility Wrightsville Unit. In 2019, the Arkansas Department of Correction dedicated a memorial site to the 21 young boys, who lost their lives in the fire decades later. The memorial includes a metal plate listing the names of every individual who didn't make it out alive. Numerous family members and those who remembered the tragedy attended the ceremony to pay their respects. But there was a lot of mystery around the spot where the boys were buried. Stephanie Webb, the owner of Haven of Rest, mentioned that the bodies were brought to the cemetery and a common burial site labeled as 114 was dug to lay them to rest. Based on the cemetery records, shortly after the fire, the remains of the deceased boys, consisting of fragments, were taken to a local funeral home. It is reported that their body parts were wrapped in newspaper. Webb stated that most of the bodies were taken to Dubison Funeral Home, which no longer exists today. She expressed doubts about how the bodies were handled, 
raising questions about questionable practices. But the question I have for you is why haven't you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel yet? According to our analytics, 93% of you aren't subscribed. Let's change that and get this channel to a million subscribers. We aren't just telling stories, we're changing lives and waking the culture up. Now let's get back into the documentary. Lawrence remarked that parents of the boys have the opportunity to select specific body parts as if choosing from a menu and claim they belong to their children. Out of the 21 boys, 7 were privately buried by their families. The remaining 14 boys were allegedly buried together in a mass grave, with the state of Arkansas covering the costs of their funerals and burials. When the ceremony ended, family members were directed away from the cemetery and were not permitted to witness the interment of the coffins into the burial plot. So. They didn't see the coffins going down into the ground, explained Lawrence. According to Webb, the cemetery's records indicate that a bronze grave marker was bought for the 14 boys a few months after their passing. This was something that the state also funded. However, she never got to see it firsthand, so she has no clue about its whereabouts. So, what really happened on that fateful day? Lawrence believes the governor and the Little Rock businessman, Dr. T.J. Rainey, were direct contributors. They benefited greatly from quickly selling the land that housed the boys. It would be easy for the governor, Rainey, and other segregationists to conspire and murder these children, especially when they get so much power by owning such an acreage of land. They could then flip it and construct an all-white boys' school in Boyle Park. Somehow, the story faded into obscurity amidst the civil rights movement. The tragedy didn't get the attention it deserved. One of the main reasons this story quickly faded from the news was mainly the prevailing racial climate of the time. During the 1950s and 1960s, the civil rights movement was gaining momentum, and numerous incidents of racial violence and discrimination were taking place throughout the United States. So, the media was more focused on prominent events and developments related to the broader civil rights struggle. The national media, at times, prioritized stories with broader implications, or those that had a more widespread impact on civil rights issues across the country. The fire happened in a relatively isolated and rural region, so it makes sense for it to diminish from the news. In the state of Arkansas, desegregation was a slow and gradual process. To understand segregation and desegregation in Arkansas, we must take a different approach than other southern states. The segregation process varied based on the area, the number of white to black residents, and whether or not these people lived in urban or rural settings. Desegregation involved a number of challenges and a lot of failures. White Americans were still terrorizing and trying to control black people in the early 20th century. It was still a black and white world. From 1882 to 1968, more than 4,700 lynchings took place in the United States. But many historians believe that the real number of black people lynched remains underreported. White mobs often tried to use questionable criminal accusations as a justification for carrying out lynchings. One common allegation was charging a black man for sexual assault against a white woman. Charges of rape were frequently fabricated, serving as a means to reinforce segregation and perpetuate stereotypes portraying black men as violent and overly sexualized aggressors. Black people were also accused of murder, robbery, arson, and vagrancy. Many victims of lynching were brutally murdered despite not being accused of any specific crime. They were killed as a result of violating societal norms or racial expectations, such as speaking to white individuals with a perceived lack of respect that contradicted what white people believed they were entitled to. In 1959, when the Wrightsville boys were burned alive, was a period when segregation was still going strong. It was a long struggle for freedom. A year later, students initiated sit-ins at racially segregated lunch counters across the southern states, intending to end segregation. This marked one of the early indications of increased youth involvement that would define the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Young black activists formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee SNCC, to desegregate public facilities and facilitate the registration of black voters. Students also played a pivotal role in the freedom rides organized by the Congress of Racial Equality (CORE) and later by SNCC. In 1960, the Interstate Commerce Commission mandated the desegregation of buses and station facilities along interstate lines. To put this legislation to the test, CORE and SNCC orchestrated a series of freedom rides. These rides involved racially mixed groups of people boarding buses from the north and attempting to travel through the south. The freedom riders defied segregation laws by sitting wherever they pleased on the buses and sought to integrate stations that were legally prohibited from discriminating against black individuals. In states like Alabama and Mississippi, the buses were subjected Subjected to violence. They were stoned and set on fire. Angry mobs also attacked the riders, and many were arrested. 
Much of this brutality was captured on film and broadcast on television news, despite the fact that many reporters and cameramen themselves were targeted and physically assaulted. In addition to desegregating lunch counters and bus stations, the civil rights movement also aimed to change the American education system. The movement played a critical role in pushing for the enforcement of desegregation orders and ensuring equal access to quality education for black students. Activists, including parents, students, and community leaders, engaged in protests, boycotts, and other forms of direct action to advocate for equal educational opportunities. As a result of these efforts, school districts across the United States were compelled to integrate their schools, allowing black students to attend previously all-white institutions. This shift aimed to provide equal educational resources, facilities, and opportunities for black students, challenging the discriminatory practices that had long hindered their academic progress. The Arkansas Dormitory Fire of 1959 left a lasting impact on the history of racial injustice and the fight for civil rights. Even though it quickly faded from the news, this tragedy claimed the lives of 21 black teenagers. It served as a tragic reminder of the ongoing struggle for equality and justice. The fire, along with other events of racial violence during that era, fueled the determination of activists and organizations to challenge segregation, fight for equal rights, and pave the way for significant changes in the American education system. This is the kind of event that should have been taught in school. Another story that they should have taught in school is the Scottsboro Boys case. The nine young black teenagers from Alabama had their lives ruined after getting accused of two white women near Scottsboro. We covered this case in a recent documentary. Click the video on the screen to watch it. We'll see you over there.